Philippians. Hey now, hey now. I'm so excited to be with you guys this morning. You have no idea. You usually don't see much of me because I'm in the blue room, which that's my jam. That's my elementary kids, which I love them so much. Um, but it is exciting to be with you today. We have been um, working with the kids and teaching them how to love God and to love others, to build their friendship with God and with others. And one of the ways that we do this is we're helping them develop their own prayer life, right? Because we need to have a foundation at, as kids so that when we become teens and adults and things like that, we have a foundation already in Christ. And so that's something my awesome crew, I love them so much. Some of you are in here. I love you and I appreciate you and you mean the world to me. And um, if you're in here and you're not a part of my crew, you could be. Uh, just saying that. Um, but I am a kid's pastor and is it in my nature to be funny at times and to be light? And so I wanted to start us off with a joke because I love jokes and I love love puns and all that kind of stuff. And so um, if you don't think it's funny, just laugh anyways, you know, just humor me, you know, no pun intended, just humor me, but, but honestly laugh, please. Okay, so there was this wife that invited some people over for dinner. How nice, right? And they were all getting ready to sit down at the table and enjoy this meal together. And the wife turned to her daughter and said, hey, would you like to say the blessing? And the little girl looked at her and said, Mom, I, I don't even know what I would even say. I don't know what to say. I don't have the words. And she said, Honey, just, just say what you hear Mommy say. You know, just, just say that. And she looked at her and said, Okay. So she bows her head and closes her eyes and waits for everybody and takes a big sigh. Lord, why did I invite all of these people to dinner? <laughs> so I think we can all agree that it's probably a good thing for us to teach our kids how to pray on their own and not just listen to what we say. Amen? Amen. Um, so uh, media, they're going to show you this amazing video really quickly as I talk. I want you to just look at what our kiddos are doing. They're looking into a mirror, which I have one right here. They're looking into this little mirror, and it's during a reflection and prayer time that we had last week. Look at them having their own personal time with the Lord, doing that. And yes, those are my kids. They're awesome. And um, what we did was we've been talking about wisdom this month, diving deep into wisdom. And it's talking about the ocean and things like that and how we can learn more um, from God and from people and from mistakes and different things like that. And so last week we um, had them look in these mirrors. And a lot of time we, we, we think we need to change all the things that are on the outside. But what God wants to change are the things that are on the inside, in our heart. And so... Um, a lot of you don't know this, but for about 20 years, I've dealt with different health conditions and different health issues. And um, for a long time, just didn't have any puzzle pieces to put it together. And just over the past, like, five years, we're starting to put some things together. And uh, recently, I've been having trouble breathing. And so if you see me at times just kind of stop for a second, it's because first service I did really well. But, like, then I talked ever afterwards and prayed. And so, like, kind of having a hard time because I have some inconsistencies with my right lung, but um, I also am uh, moderate to severe anemic, so I don't have enough oxygen going to my organs, and so it's very hard for me to breathe at times, um, but not today, Satan. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> so I'm not going to allow that to stop me, um, but it may just stop me for just a second. You know what I'm saying? Um, but I was in service last week, and I just kind of found out I got an inhaler because it can give you asthmatic symptoms and things like that. And so with other, some other health conditions I have, it just kind of makes it worse. And I, I had to take my inhaler. And so I disappeared for a minute and came back, and I had to sit down. And I asked them, I was like, is it okay if I sit down? They're like, yeah, you know, why do you need to sit? And I was like, well, I'm having these issues. And they're like, sit down, you know. And so sweet and so kind. And Kayla Lee, she, um, one of my awesome crew, you know when you just have people in your life that you just love so much, and God just literally had, has blessed your life with their presence in your life? Kayla's one of those people to me. And um, that's really my crew. Um, but she was praying, and she said, if anybody would like to come up for prayer, I'd ask that you would come up, and we'll pray for you, you know. And nobody really moved yet, you know, because it's like, I'm not doing that. I'm going to wait till the first person moves. You know, kids. And, and adults, they do that too. So, so um, she said, well, would anybody like to pray for Pastor Heather because of what she's dealing with? 
And Sully Henderson, he stood straight up. He was one of the kids that I got to pray with at kids camp this year, and he's accepted Jesus for the first time. And <laughs> a lot of celebration today. I'm, I'm, it's going to get better. I'm just going to tell you. It's, you're going to be clapping the whole time. So he stands up, and he beelines to me, tears in his eyes, and he said, I'll pray for you, Pastor Heather. He put his hand on my shoulder, and he prayed out loud. And then Amoriana came up, and then Rosalie came up, and Sam came up, one of our kindergartners came up, and Caitlin and many others, and they all placed their hands on me and started praying for me one by one. You see, in January when I stepped in, the kids didn't really pray much. Um, they didn't really know how to do that. And um, so our crew really just thought it would be a good job to, or a good thing to really focus on this. And so we started focusing on prayer, and their hearts started to shift because that's what God does. And they were serving the body. And I will tell you, that made me feel strong in that moment. I felt so weak physically, but in that moment, I was so strong because of those kids. So parents, you're doing a good job. <laughs> keep showing up. Keep bringing them. They're learning. They're growing. It may not always feel like that, but God, it will not return void. So we have been in the series in Philippians. It's been awesome. Um, it was about five weeks ago that we had, uh, or a little bit more, uh, that we had the last two weeks. So I'm just going to recap real quick. Ben talked about um, when Jer uh, I almost said germ men. I don't even know, like Jordan and Jeremy together. I don't know what that was about, but maybe we need to like put your names together and figure out something. But as Jordan talked about humility breeds obedience and then obedience, suffering, suffering, death. When we talked about that, well, Ben focused on the death part, not the physical, which some people have died for the cause of Christ, but he was talking about dying to our own will. And then after that, Jordan spoke in Philippians 2, 19 through 24, that he challenged us that as we accept God's will for our lives, we grow in our relationship with him. And he provides people in our lives to help us do that. And so in verses 22 through 24, Timothy was a person for Paul that helped him do that. But there's another person that we're going to talk about today as I, as I open up in Philippians 2, 25 through 30. We're going to talk about a person that helped car uh, Paul carry the work of God and how he was so important for his obedience. So we're going to start it out. So verse 25, however, I thought it necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus. Yes, I did Google that name to be able to say that. So Epaphroditus, okay, when you're up here, you feel like the tension. I have to. So I went over it many, many times. I thought about calling him just E, but I was like, no, I can do this. So who has been my brother and my companion and fellow soldier who was also sent as your messenger to take care of my needs? So who is Epaphroditus? Well, he, he played a key role in biblical history. He is mentioned twice in the book of Philippians, and he was a messenger from the church of Philippi that delivered a care package to Paul from them. This was his home church, and he delivered this care package to Paul. So I'll tell you a little bit more of where, like, Epaphroditus came from and stuff like that as we get deeper into these verses. But that's just like a snapshot, okay? Everybody go like this. It's a snapshot. All right. So, yes, you're participating. I love this. It's like being with my kids. Okay, so Paul is sending Epaphroditus back, okay, explaining how much of a blessing he is. And he's been so obedient in his walk for Christ. Paul considered him to be family. He said, he is my brother. He's, he brought things to take care of my needs. He's like family because families take care of each other. He's had the same goals as Paul. He, he worked with him. He was a co-worker, a companion with him. To the, to the church of Philippi, he was a messenger, and that's great. But to Paul, he was so much more. He even called him a soldier. That, that meant that he was a fighter. He shared in the same trials and struggles as Paul as they worked together. This man was somebody to be modeled after. He was an amazing person. And let me explain a little bit more why he was. So verse 26, for he has been longing for all of you and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. So I don't know about you, but when I'm sick, I'm not really thinking about everybody else. You know what I'm saying? Like, I need some Gatorade. I need some ramen. I need, you know, all these different things. Like, please help me. I'm the one that's sick, right? Well, how many of you are moms out there 
And when you're sick, you don't really get to take much time off. I will have to say I am extremely blessed. I'm not lucky. I am blessed. My husband is amazing at taking care of me when I am sick. And he's like, no, just just lay there. And he closed the door. Don't bother your mom. So, I mean, like, he's he's amazing. Pray. If you don't have a godly man yet and you're a woman and you want one, pray for it and God will send it to you. So, verse 26, Epaphroditus took no thought of himself when he got sick distressed, completely stressed out because the church heard of his illness and he didn't want them to worry. He didn't want them to worry, okay? Then Paul says in verse 27, he certainly was sick and close to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Okay, so what does that mean? Had mercy on Paul? How? Okay, so Epaphroditus became ill, almost died. God had mercy on him and granted him health. Okay, we, we, we heard that, but... But Paul, we know, had performed many miracles in the Bible. We learn this from the word. And don't tell me that he wasn't praying for his friend to get healed, okay? He had performed these miracles. He knew who the power came from, and that's what he's stating right here. Paul was sharing the greatness of God's power. He was saying God had mercy on him, not Paul. It was God's power. And the sorrows upon sorrows that he was referring to was the fact that Paul was in prison, He was already suffering a lot of stuff, a lot of trials and struggles. And the death of his friend would have just added upon all of that. And he's like, thank you, God, for sparing me too. Like my friend is is healed. He's like close to death, but you're healing him. And so verses 28 through 30, to wrap up these verses, it says, So I have sent him all the more eagerly. So that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may may be less concerned about you. Welcome him home in the Lord with great joy and appreciate and honor men like him. Because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me, which distance prevented you from rendering personally. So Paul was sending him eagerly because Epaphroditus was healed and he was excited for him to get home to to the Philippians to the church of Philippi. He went above and beyond the call of duty Epaphroditus did. Always thinking of others, he put the interests of others above his own. He modeled the mind of Christ, just like Ben talked about when he, he shared his sermon weeks and weeks ago in uh, Philippians 2, 4 through 5, when he said what's best for others is what's best for me, okay? Paul is addressing the church, saying, hey, this is my friend, and he deserves a huge welcome home party. I mean, I want you to order the cake. I want you to get the DJ. I want you to get balloons, bounce houses, petting zoos, everything. Invite everybody because he risked his life for you, and he is bringing back something special for you. But do you know what that special thing was? Okay, I want everybody to go like this. Because I'm about to blow your mind. All right. So Paul knew that Epaphroditus, when he got home, he would deliver the original manuscript of the book of Philippians. Mind blown, right? He was so obedient. So let's, let's recap really quick, okay? Epaphroditus took kick care package to Paul. Got sick, almost died. Distressed because his church heard that he was sick, didn't want them to worry, still thinking of others. Continues the work of the Lord. The Lord heals him. Paul is excited his friend is spared. Tells the church, hey, I'm sending him back. You better welcome him back. He needs a party. When he got there, he delivered the book of Philippians to the church. What an incredible journey. Crazy. Humility breeds obedience. Obedience breeds suffering. Suffering brings death. So let me give you a little bit of background for Epaphroditus. I told you I would before he came to the Lord. See, Epaphroditus was born of paganism. Okay, pagan origin was his name. And so his name actually meant belonging to Epaphrodite, the goddess of love. It was actually like incorporated into his name. Paganism is worshiping more than one God. And so this is what he was born into. He became a follower of Jesus. And the power of the gospel showed that a man or woman, can be set free from dead paganism to serve a living God. It is possible. The new birth in Christ conquered Epaphroditus' birth name. It didn't matter what he was born into. It mattered who he chose to serve. And so new life can always be had in Christ no matter where we are in life, no matter where we are. See, Epaphroditus was born of another God, but now serving the one and only God. 
It's choices, it's habits, it's changes of heart. A lot of excuses that we give, though, that what we can't have life changes because, you know, I, I'm just not smart enough. I don't have enough experience. You know, I don't have time. I wouldn't even know what to say. You know, Pastor Heather, you're up on stage and, like, you just know what to say. Do you know how long and how many hours I spent praying and asking God what he wanted to say? I told Ben this morning that I was feeling so heavy this morning and not because I'm nervous. I am an extrovert. (laughs) I don't get nervous very often. I was feeling the weight because this is a huge responsibility. I am held to a higher standard being on the stage and I was feeling that weight today. I want to be able to speak what God's given to me, not me. I don't want you to see Heather I want you to see Jesus. I'm not ready. I'm not prepared. I have too much baggage. I'm not qualified. I've done too many bad things, and people wouldn't even want me if they knew my past. How do you think Epaphroditus felt? He was known for serving more than one God. He probably felt that way. My health won't allow it. I can sit up here today and tell you that If you allow your health to stand in the way, it will. I can't sing anymore. I used to be on the worship team. And then I took the job to be the elementary pastor. And that's where I'm supposed to be. But I love singing. I can't even sing in the car with my kids anymore. Because of my health condition. But I will not stop singing Or maybe sometimes we just get too scared. You see, the greatest thing about being a follower of Jesus is that it has nothing to do with your ability. Just like with Epaphroditus. He didn't wait. God doesn't wait until we are just ready. God doesn't say, when you do this, then I'll choose you. When you meet this standard, then I'll use you. That's not how God works. You see, God, God made you for a purpose when you were in heaven. He formed you. Before you were even in your mother's womb, he had a purpose for you. Why do we forget that? Why do we limit what God can do when he, we're living and breathing? How does this all work? It doesn't make sense. But it's because we have a God who who has a plan. He has good plans. You see, with Epaphroditus, many people benefited from him coming to the Lord and belonging to him. We are today. We're reading from the book of Philippians. We're learning, gaining wisdom from the Lord. And this is why Paul was saying, his presence is worthy of honor and cause for rejoicing because he's being obedient. And his obedience changed everything. Everything. Epaphroditus, yes, was only mentioned twice in The Bible, but his humility of following Christ led to obedience, delivering the package and partnering with Paul for the kingdom, which sparked suffering. He almost died physically, risking his life, but really died to his own will by continuing to think of others as greater than himself. And he got healed and brought back the book of Philippians to Philippi. I may never get healed. I had to come to that realization this year. It's been hard. Because I want to be. It limits so many things that I can't do. But I will still praise him. Until I have no more breath and I'm in heaven, which I will praise him there, but I'm going to continue his work because I'm part of the body of Christ. So let me explain a little bit of that. Did you guys know that we have Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey here today? Why are you you laughing? Like, that's not a joke. Come on, Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey. Let's give them a round of applause as they come up to the stage for me. After you've seen this illustration, you may not want their autograph. All right. So Travis Kelsey is going to stand on that side. This is Patrick Mahomes with us today. They're just going to play catch back and forth. You know why I talk for a minute. So remember I told you, you were supposed to do that before. Okay. I know, I know. 
I know, they're pretty amazing, but I still need you to listen, okay? All right. So so they know that, you know, their their bodies are, are properly working, okay? So, so Patrick Mahomes knows that when he throws to Kelsey, he needs to look where he's at, and his, his arm, his elbow, everything does what it's supposed to do. And, and Kelsey knows that when he sees the ball coming, he's going to catch it with his hands, right? Okay, so what if, um, I'm not even going to talk about the preseason games right now, but, but what if on September 5th on their first game, what if Patrick Mahomes comes into the huddle and he says, hey, you know, guys, um, I know we haven't practiced this, but listen, I have this awesome idea. Like, I think it's going to work. Every time I pass to you, I'm going to close my eyes. Look, I'm not even going to look where you're at. Like, I'm just going to throw it, but you can do it. Like, just move to it. Like, you'll be able to do it, okay? You know what to do. Just do that. So, Patrick, close your eyes and throw to Travis Kelsey. Okay, all right, all right, so not bad. So, but Travis Kelsey, he still had his eyes open. He was doing his, his job, right? His body was working properly. So, so we have that, but then what if Travis Kelsey comes and he's like, hey, Patrick's doing that. Like, like what I'm going to do is I know I usually catch with my hands, but I think it's going to work really, really well that every time Patrick throws to me with his eyes closed, I'm going to catch with my elbows. Like, I'm going to do, do that. It's going to work real well, guys. Like, like, everything will still be the same. I think we're going to make more runs. We're going to get touchdowns. Like, it's going to be great. Let, let's, uh, so let's just let's see how that works. So he's going to close his eyes. He's going to th throw to Jordan, or not Jordan, sorry, Kelsey. And he was, we're going to see if he can catch the ball here. Let's just see. Oh. Let's try one more time. Let's try one more time. I mean, he, he's been practicing, you know, guys, but I'm kind of waiting for his elbows to be like, clink, and that hurts real bad. So let's, 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 <laughs> okay, let's try it again. Let's try it again. Okay, go close your eyes. No. Oh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, like, knock a guitar down. All right, let's give a hand clap to our volunteers today. You can catch them out in the lobby today after church and get their autograph. All right, so. We understand that they are a part of a body of players, correct? When the body of players and their own personal bodies are doing what they are made to do and they're functioning properly, the whole body benefits. Okay, so we got that. Let me read to you 1 Corinthians 12, 14 through 27. i got to stand up now. I'm getting ready to preach, so let me move this. All right, so 1 Corinthians 12, 14 through 27. The human body has many parts. The foot might say, because I am not a hand, I am not part of the body. But saying this would not stop the foot from being a part of the body. The ear might say, because I am not an eye, I am not a part of the body. But saying this would not stop the ear from being a part of the body. Now, this part's gross. If the whole body were an eye... Yuck, it'd be like Mike Wazowski walking around. You know what I mean? No. Does, do you guys not know who Mike Wazowski is? Like, okay, okay, okay. Um, so that'd be gross. It would not be able to hear. If the whole body were an ear, it would not be able to smell. Each part of the body, if each part of the body were the same, there would be no body. But truly God put all the parts, each one of them, in the body as he wanted them. I think that needs a marinate for a minute as God wanted them. So then there are many parts, but only one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the foot, I don't need you. No, those parts of the body that seem to be the weaker are really necessary. And the parts of the body we think are less deserving are the parts to which we give the most honor. We give special respect to the parts we want to hide. And the more respectable parts of our body need no special care. But God put the body together and gave more honor to the parts that need it. So our body would not be divided. God wanted the different parts to care the same for each other. If one part of the body suffers, all parts suffer with it. Or if one part of the body is honored, all parts share in its honor. Okay. Everybody do this. with you. Uh-huh. Together you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is part of that body. Us, and let me tell you, every time I preach, God deals with me first. I'm part of the body too. I've got to do my part. Some of you may be here today and you might be thinking, 
or online might be thinking, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm part of the body of Christ, but you know what, to tell you the truth, it's not that big of a deal because nobody really notices even when I'm gone. So it's not like it's anybody's like really suffering. <clears throat> we notice because the rest of the body were overcompensating. Did you know that the mechanics of the body are carefully balanced? That when a joint is forced to endure greater forces and weight, it can lend to deterioration of the bones of, or injuries to ligaments and tendons. And unfortunately, new pain often occurs as a result because these compensating joints and muscles are not usually designed to carry this added burden. Consequently, they become painful or even injured with overuse, long-term or chronic comp I can't even say it. Compensatory pain can lead to debility and increasingly painful symptoms. So what is this saying for us as the body of Christ? This is what happens to us here at COTFC when you aren't obedient. And this is not in any way, please, please understand this is not in any way judgment this is not in any way coming down on you. This is us as a body. I am talking to myself, the staff, everybody here the same, because this is our responsibility according to the word. The body suffers when we, and we don't get the blessing of you being a part of us when you aren't obedient to what God is asking you to do. We are a family, and families take care of each other. And this might be hard for you to hear today, but understand this. In Ephesians 4, 15 through 16, it says, But speaking the truth in love, in all things, both our speech and our lives expressing his truth, let us grow up in all things into him, following his example, who is the head, Christ. From him, the whole body, the church, that's us, in all its various parts, joined and knitted firmly together by every joint supplies, which every part is working properly, causes the body to grow and mature, building itself up in unselfish love. Speaking the truth in love. We love you. We love you being a, a part of the body of Christ here at COTFC. But we need you. Desperately, we need you. So my question today for you is this. Is the body us? Is the body growing and becoming stronger from your obedience or overcompensating from your lack. Because I will tell you, there are a lot of volunteers here on different teams that are overcompensating and they're exhausted. They are tendons that are being stretched and weight is being put on them and they're about to snap. They're getting burnt out and they are getting hurt because they don't feel the whole body supporting each other and us becoming stronger. They are getting weaker. And it's not just blue room. It's not just greening. It's over all of it. We need you. We need you to grow. We need you to grow us. And this is what it means, that question. Are you hearing the word of God and are you acting on it? Because this is called wisdom, and that's what we're talking about in the Blue Room. Wisdom is finding out what you should do, and you do it. And I tell the kids, it sounds really easy at times. Like, you just know what to do, and you should do it. But I will tell you, it's not going to be easy without the Lord's help. A lot of times we know what to do, but we just don't even know where to start. But that's why we're the body of Christ, so we can help each other do it. That's why. You don't have to do life alone. That's crazy. God provided us. Remember, if you're the I, you're not supposed to be alone because that's weird. If I was walking around and I looked like a big old ear and nobody else looked like that, that would be weird. Come on. I'd be able to hear real well, but it'd still be weird. But the thing is, is God wants us to do life together. You know why you're, you feel alone and depressed? It's because you're doing life alone. And you won't let us be a part of your life. 
You know why you feel like you have no friends? Because you want to join a small group. And like I said, this is no judgment. I'm telling you, you're missing out. You're missing the joy and the blessing of being part of something great that the Lord has brought into your life so that you can grow and you can be stronger. And you can have friends and you can enjoy this life that's really hard. And you can get closer to the Lord. And you can feel the warmth of his presence. It's like the sunshine. When you go outside and you just got done with winter and it's starting to be spring and you stand on the porch and you feel that first really warm day, that's what Jesus' presence is like. And if you haven't felt that, I would love to help you do that. Our staff would love to help you. Is there anybody else out here besides our staff that would love to help somebody do that? This is why... We are called to be followers of Jesus, this, to be a part of the body of Christ. 1 Peter 2, 24 says that he himself bore our sins, him in his body, in his body on the cross, so that we might die to our sins and live for righteousness, that by his wounds we have been healed. What does it mean to be righteous, okay? When you hear that word, it's kind of like, whoa. Like, there's just no way I can be righteous. Like, it makes it, to me, it makes it sound like royalty. And like, like a knight or something. Like, I can't be righteous. This is what righteous, being righteous means. You have a faith in and a love for God that causes you to order your life according to his will. Humility, obedience, suffering, death. We, we, we want to try to be humble. And then we want to try to be obedient. But nobody wants to suffer. Of course not. Suffering's hard. And it stinks. But what do you think Jesus thought of when he was getting beaten and on the cross? He wasn't thinking about like, oh my gosh, I don't want to be here. He was thinking of you. And he is not even asking us to suffer like that. We are so blessed. But I will tell you, This is the biggest reason why we take communion is we are remembering the sacrifice and the suffering that Jesus did. And he really literally did die for us. Epaphroditus almost died for the cause of Christ. For us. He brought back the book of Philippians. When was the last time that Jesus asked you to die? To really? I haven't been asked that any time lately. I don't know about you, but that's just me. But I am telling you right now, there were two years ago when Ben and I were lead pastors. I was a, I've been a pastor's kid my whole life. My mom and dad are still pastors. And I loved going to church. I loved it. I wasn't the rebellious pastor's kid. That was my sister, and she serves the Lord, though, now. And she's a pastor. She's awesome. But what I'm saying is I saw how people hurt my mom and dad really, really bad. And I'm so ashamed to admit this. But I hated people. (laughs) And still did, even being a lead pastor at times. (laughs) Because they were mean. And my kids are just, (laughs) my kids would get hurt. People would hurt my five year old. It's not okay. And so because of that, I got so mad at people and wasn't living according to God's will because I can't hate people and love God because the greatest commandments are to love God and love people. Like you, you love people like you love yourself and I didn't love myself because I knew it was wrong to not like people and, and it was just hard to get over. And I'm so thankful that through the sabbatical and coming here, to COTFC, that God was able to heal my heart and help me to love people again and to have grace and to see them for who God saw them, even though they were just making really bad choices or being hurtful. But I'm so thankful that Jesus reminds me that the great sacrifice that he made because he took my sin 
upon his body so that I could be a part of the body. Communion brings unity among believers. Communion is a way that we can live according to God's will, a righteous way of living and, and accepting what God has for us. And it affirms our shared identity in the body of Christ. You see, we are partaking the elements which represent Jesus' body. The blood is the juice that was poured out for us, that covered our sins, and the, the, the little cracker is for the body that was broken for us, for healing, for new life, and life in e eternity with Jesus, if that's what we choose. But we partake of the body of Christ, or we are partaking of the body of Jesus to signify that we are part of the body of Christ. That's why we do this. I wanna give you an opportunity, not a chance, I wanna give you an opportunity, just like I do my kids every week. It's our reflection time. I wish you all had mirrors, but it was gonna be like $500, so I was like, eh, it's a no. But you can look in the mirror at home, ladies, you know you do it, or reflection or wherever you're at, and be reminded that like the Lord wants us to look inward at our hearts. So I want you to have an opportunity right now to look inward. But before we do that, if you're here today or online with us and you don't know Jesus because you don't have a personal friendship with him, I wanna stop and I wanna give you an opportunity to do that. Because that's the greatest decision that you could ever make. And the coolest thing is, is it's so easy not to be a follower of Jesus, but it's easy to accept him because he has been waiting for you for a long time. And all you have to do is to say, Jesus, I believe you're real. I believe you died on the cross for me, for my sins. I ask that you would forgive me of those sins and you would lead my life and I would live according to your will. If you said that right now, you have just become a member of the body of Christ. Right now, and that's the first step. There are many steps afterwards, and we are more than happy to take every step with you. But that's the first and most important step. So if you took that step today, you are a member of the body of Christ. You get to partake of the body of Christ with us. That's communion. So as we take communion this morning, I want you to reflect that you're holding a mirror and I want you to have God look inward at your heart and allow the Lord to show you the things inside of your heart that need to change. Maybe, maybe you're like me and you just had too much hurt from people and you were scared to forgive and you're scared to put yourself out there again because you're like, they're just gonna hurt me again. And it's probably gonna happen we're people, we sin. But don't miss out on the beautiful joy that the Lord wants to bring to your life because you're so scared and you're skeptical of others. Remember, we are not Jesus. We are called to be Christ-like, but we're not Jesus. So Chris, Christian sin, that's why we have to keep coming back to the heart of worship, keep coming back to the Lord. Maybe you've been doing things your way and not his. Maybe you need to start walking in obedience today in his will. You're like, God, I want to humble myself and I want to. Like, like us, Jeremy's always saying, and I think about it every day now, like just a loneliness of mind. Like just humbling ourselves. I'm like, Lord, this is not our church. This is not our program. This is not our will, but God is yours. And maybe you're not even there yet. Maybe that's where you got to start with humility first before you can be obedient. Or maybe you, you want to start or continue to work with the rest of the body. We would love that. It would be nice to take some pressure off some of the joints that are working right now. You help the body grow and become stronger together. And it could be really easy for you right now to rush through this moment because we take communion every week and it could be just like, oh, let's just clockwork. Let's don't do that, please. Please understand this is an opportunity to see what God wants to change because all of us have something and it's hard and it's scary, but we're here with you as the body. So let's come right now to the father.
offer ourselves in humility and allow his love to change our hearts today. Let's take communion.